I am so excited to introduce you to my friends, Missy and Alice. Both of them have been affected by breast cancer and they created an online tool called Cancer Besties to help you understand your imaging report and the questions to ask your provider. So welcome ladies. Robin, thank you so much for having us. Uh, we're so thrilled to be here and we're, we're filled with just, just excitement to share our stories with you. I'm excited to get to know you both better because Missy and I have become online cancer besties and I really don't know much about her. So I'm excited to hear the full story. Um, yeah, yeah, so I'll go ahead and I'll go ahead and dive in and um, tell you a little bit about my story and my journey. So my journey started, um, I guess my journey with breast cancer began unexpectedly when I found a lump in my left breast, initially thinking it was the size of a gumball. Of course, I freaked out, um, which led me to getting a next day appointment with a nurse practitioner who, of course, despite uh, like her initial doubt, was stunned by the actual size, which was the size that resembled a gumball. Um, mm -hmm. And at that point, it was recommended that I go see a surgeon ASAP before I even got any sort of imaging or um, any sort of testing at all. And then, mm -hmm. of course, genetic testing with a family history. So I discovered I was BRCA1 positive status aligned with wow. a strong family history. Yeah. Um, wow. And then I had an 83% chance of lifetime cancer, which is pretty scary. Yes. And that led me towards a prophylactic mastectomy. Wow. Um, so yeah. you, that all happened very fast then. You found a lump and then a few, like a few weeks later you were found to be BRCA positive? Yes. I Within like days, I think. Um, obviously, the genetic testing takes a couple of weeks to come back. Um, but I saw a surgeon maybe two days after discovering the lump. Wow. Did you get any imaging during that time? Yes, actually, I had I had so much imaging. So I think I yeah. had, yeah, I think I had three mammograms, multiple ultrasounds and an MRI. Um, so I'm obviously thankful to have that opportunity. So tell me a little bit about what the imaging showed. I guess the mammogram probably showed that you have dense breast tissue, right? Of course, yes. Right. So, and, and then the ultrasound, what did that show? So same thing, they couldn't really see much of anything. I ended up having, right before my mastectomy, I found out that I had like 30 something masses in there, thankfully all benign, um, but they couldn't find, they didn't see that on the mammogram or any of the other testing, there was just too wow. many, too much breast or uh, dense breast tissue. Uh -huh. So a lot of times women have multiple fibroadenomas, which is a very common mass. I don't know if that's what it yep. ended up being. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's a very common kind of, you know, but they never did a biopsy in them before you ended up getting your double mastectomy. Is that right? Oh, no, I had multiple biopsies as well. Oh. And the lump that was actually a golf ball size, I had to have it drained multiple times because it just kept filling back up. Oh. Um, but benign, again, knock on all the things that it was benign. So some of those are probably cysts as well, right? Like those yeah. are also benign masses. They're just fluid filled little sacs and they're very common. Um, and then, so you had your double mastectomy. Did that go smoothly? <laughs> Do they ever go smoothly, Robin? No, <laughs> so, in, in I know the answer. 20, yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, and I think that's a big miscon misconception, which is something I'd like to touch on as well. But in January of 2020, just before the pandemic really started running rampant, I underwent my double mastectomy um, with expanders before my implants. And I was initially told that I would have the expanders in for six weeks. But as we know, the multiple challenges of COVID, um, it extended the duration of my expander phase. And I explained this, I guess, candidly as having two rock hard flat boulders thrown into my mm -hmm. chest for eight months. So not yeah. six weeks, it was eight months. And that was, wow. that was tough. That's a lot. Yeah. So I think that this perspective just sheds light on the often underestimated physical and emotional toll of post mastectomy recovery. Yeah, and so with BRCA, it increases your risk of breast and ovarian cancer. Did you, so you have children, right? Is that correct? Correct, yep, I have two girls. 
Um, so a lot of times, you know, when women find out that they are BRCA positive, it brings up a lot of questions about what this means for my future fertility, right? Because a lot of times people do end up getting their ovaries out eventually, but that puts you into early menopause. Um, and also just what this means for your children. Yeah, it, right. it's, I think that was one of the first things. I wasn't necessarily scared for myself when I got my BRCA diagnosis because I think I was tested for like 150 genetic mutations. So when the genetic um, counselor called me and she said, okay, so bad news, good news situation. And good news was I only had one. Bad mm -hmm. news was it was probably one of the worst ones. Um, yeah. And my brain instantly went to my girls, right? So they have yeah. a 50-50 chance of inheriting this gene um, or gene mutation and so neither have been tested so one is 12 and one is 20 the 12 year old is too young obviously mm -hmm. um, and the 20 year old i just don't think she's quite ready because while there's a lot of power in having the knowledge it also is a lot of responsibility in having that yeah. knowledge that's a hard does she understand that you are BRCA positive and what that means potentially she for her or, or yeah Thankfully, they both do. I think uh -huh. um, I've educated them from day one in understanding what this means, what it could mean for them, how it could impact them. And and they've been right by my side of this entire journey. So that's amazing. very thankful for that. So I just want to mention before we get to Alice's story. So in terms of BRCA positive, um, we would treat your daughters until they're tested like they are considered high risk. So um, we actually start screening um, high risk individuals with at at age 25 with a breast MRI. And then at age 30, we add on a mammogram as well. So we kind of alternate between the two. So until she's genetically tested, we consider her um, high risk. Um, we don't usually typically have those conversations until their 20s because, right, there's nothing you could do about it before then. Exactly. So age 25 is really when you start taking the actions to find your breast cancer early, God forbid, and to lower your risk. So those are all really important conversations that you'll Definitely. be having. Yep. Okay. More to yeah. come. More to come. More on that later. So Alice, tell me a little bit about you and your breast cancer story. Sure. So my journey, I guess, kind of starts similarly in time with Missy's, but a couple of years, um, like it just was delayed a little bit. So I turned 40 during the pandemic. Um, I did what a lot of people did. I did not go to the doctor. I, you know, and I didn't think, hey, if I get a mammogram or not, it's fine. Like, so I skipped a lot of things during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, and then I moved across the country and um, because we had a uh, loss in the family. So we moved across the country to be close to family. And, you know, when you move across the country, you also delay looking for a new doctor. I don't, I didn't yeah. know anyone. I didn't know um, where to look. So eventually I found a primary care um, and he's the one that pushed me to get my very first mammogram a couple of years too late. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so I credit him to at least have pushed me to do it. And that's um, when I got the call to say, hey, come back um let's do a follow-up mammogram let's do an ultrasound um and so it was actually in between that time I'm, i did find a lump but i didn't mm -hmm. think i thought you know this is probably very like dr pimple popper type thing where yeah it's and, and like missy was saying maybe it was, it was a, a, a a cyst and i'm like that's gotta mm -hmm. be it. it can't be anything worse than that right. um and so i did I, of course i dragged my feet as well um getting yeah. the follow-up and um they did immediately the tech came out and said so we recommend you getting a biopsy mm -hmm. um and so soon after got the biopsy found out it was um cancer and then oh. uh, eventually we realized it was uh between like stage 2b and 3a um mm -hmm. and it was her 2 positive um breast cancer wow so, <laughs> what I mean, what a shock, especially on your first mammogram. Yeah. Like, have. yeah. Um, did you have any family history or any risk factors? No, I, um, I don't have any family history. I, um, I don't smoke 
I don't mm-hmm. drink a ton. Um, like it's very rare that I drink. Like mm-hmm. I, I just felt like I was also like eating pretty healthy too. Um, so I just could not understand how this happened. And I think that's a very similar story. Um, it's well. so common, unfortunately. And I'm so happy you're sharing this story because I think, you know, the two greatest risk factors for um, developing breast cancer are being female and getting older. So we're all at risk. Okay. And there are certainly lifestyle modifications you could do to lower your risk. But even if you do everything perfectly, you could still develop breast cancer, which is why um, breast cancer screening is so important. And I'm so glad that your doctor encouraged you to get your screening mammogram beginning at age 40, because there are some recommendations and some doctors that follow these that say starting at age 50 every two years. And I will tell you, all the breast cancer experts will tell you that is not enough. 40 every year saves the most lives, you know, especially like, God forbid, if you waited another few years, your, your outcome would have been completely different and your treatment would have looked completely different. Yeah. So so what did your treatment look like for you then? Sure. I followed what I think is pretty standard for HER2 positive. I did six rounds of chemo combined with targeted therapy. Um, that kicked my ass, if, I'm okay, mm-hmm. if I can say that. Um, yes. And then I also did the uh, double mastectomy, and that's where Missy and I really connected and like mm-hmm. really understood each other. Um, and then after that, I completed the rest of the year, the year-long treatment with targeted therapy. So everything just wrapped up this past November. Wow. Congratulations. Thank you. It's a huge deal. Amazing. A huge deal. So on top of going through the breast cancer treatment and diagnosis, this was all during the pandemic, right? Yeah. So like towards, yeah, I guess if we consider ourselves still in the pandemic, um, we are, uh, (laughs) I feel like it's a lifelong pandemic. (laughs) Yeah. No, it's a new normal. It changes everything because you are probably a lot of times you weren't able to bring people in the rooms with you during treatment. Yeah. Which I I joke a lot further. Yeah, I joke a lot about how you see in movies where people are like hanging out with you and or you're yeah. in a room with like other cancer patients all like playing mm-hmm. cards. I'm like, that wasn't me. I was very isolated in a small room uh, um, doing this during the sessions. That's um, well, you got through it and I'm so it's so amazing. And your story is so important. And I'm happy to hear that you're on the other side of it. Um, do you have children? Did you have any um, issues with that? Yeah, so I have two boys, um, and we had just gone through a lot of loss as well. And so my biggest concern was just how are we going to get through this, like yet another um, big moment in our family that we have to get through. But they were troopers, Mm -hmm. and they were very sweet. Um, So I think we just said, this is easier compared to the loss we suffered, (laughs) you know, the last two years. So um, And I I think it's it's a... That, that's incredible. And I also think it's important, like, so a lot, the reason I'm asking is because sometimes when people are diagnosed with breast cancer and they don't have children, a lot of times um, breast cancer treatment can impact your, for, for your fertility. Mm. So they have to do a lot of fertility preservation. Um, if, you know, especially these younger patients that are not married, don't have children yet, it makes it even more complicated because on top of the, the chemotherapy and the treatments that we typically do for breast cancer, we're also talking about egg freezing and fertility preservation, yeah. which is such a complicated thing to throw in the mix, like to have to make these decisions about your future fertility while you're trying to navigate breast cancer. So All right. it's yeah. really complex. I think for me, that's why I was a bit more at peace knowing that I was BRCA1 status, if peace is even the right word, knowing that I was done having children, right? Yeah. Like, what did it mean for them now? And so that's where my my primary focus went is like, okay, mm-hmm. I'll do what I have to do for myself and make sure that I'm, I'm here forever as long as I can be for them. But yes. how do I help them navigate now what this looks like for them? Because obviously they're just getting to the ages of thinking about family planning and what their future looks like. Definitely. So I wanted to hear more about how the two of you know each other and how you um, connected over breast cancer and then how you turn that into the cancer besties. 
Yeah. So um, before Missy and I became cancer besties, we were actually work besties. Mm -hmm. Um, We have a picture of the two of us where we met each other in person for the first time, like right after I started. Um, And we barely knew each other, probably a little drunk from happy hour. (laughs) And and now we joke that like, oh, we we wish we could do that trip all over again because we Uh became much closer after that. Um, there's mm-hmm. nothing that brings two people together. Well, I would say besides cancer, but also work trauma. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, very true. Yeah. So then, um, of course, Missy was there um, to support me when I found I had breast cancer. Um, but and I think it was not until I was about to um, get the double mastectomy where I said, Missy, I don't know anything about this. I'm not getting a ton of information. Um, besides here's what's going to happen, but like for my surgeon, but you know, there's not actually a ton of what else should I expect? Um, Mm -hmm. And so Missy really supported me before, during, and after that time. And that's when we really started to just talk about, you know, we just felt like the, but Missy first, I was still trying to get through uh, uh, the recovery, but she started talking about like how she felt there was a something tugging at her to do something um, to help Mm -hmm. other patients like us. Um, I kind of just said, let me get through this first and then we can talk. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. Okay. Deal. I got it. (laughs) But the more we, we just talked about it and like the different problems we experienced throughout our journey, we just, um, so Missy and I are both in technology and we love solving problems. And so we kept thinking, how can we solve this with technology? Mm-hmm. Um, and so um, we thought we thought a lot about um, just building different things. And one of the first things um, we thought of were was to simplify um, the, the whole experience around your lab report. And so that's kind of mm-hmm. how we started forming Cancer Besties. And we had have definitely had like a bigger vision than just a single tool. Um, but that's how we got started. I love that story. What, so what exactly is Cancer Besties for the people listening? Good question. <laughs> so Cancer Besties is your go-to toolbox for taking charge of your cancer journey and sort of being your own advocate. I think we often take everything our physicians and doctors say um, at 100% face value, right? We, we trust them, we believe in them, we know that what they're talking about to be true, but is that absolutely true for me and my own journey and my experiences? And mm-hmm. I think we all know ourselves better than anyone knows us, right? So um, understanding what your test results mean. So we're making tools that help you navigate through each phase of your journey. Um, So with Cancer Besties, we want you to be in control, make informed choices and feel like really empowered about the choice that you're making. So last year, like at the end of last year, actually we launched our first tool. It is a tool that takes your lab report, whether it's a mammogram, an MRI, a CT scan, a biopsy, like we talked about, is, is it a cyst versus you know, a a tumor, and it simplifies it into plain English and gives you um, about five questions that you should be asking your medical team based off of your report. I love this. I mean, as a radiologist, so I'm the doctor who issues the imaging report, and I understand that there is a lack of understanding between what my report says and what you read, right? So there is that huge lag. So I, it's so incredible what you've done. I've been playing around with your toolbox a little bit just to test it. And we've been working together to improve it. And it's so helpful. Like it helps you understand what dense breast tissue means and what, you know, that this is what, bi- what the bi means, which I know we're going to talk about. Um, and I think it's so important, especially those follow-up questions to ask your doctor are so valuable. So kudos to you both. Thank you. Cause you yeah. definitely don't know what you don't know. Right. So yes. that's kind of where we come in. Yeah. yeah. And if you don't mind, I'll kind of tell you kind of my story. And so all of this was like selfishly to, I look back and I go, I want to fix the problem I had at the very beginning. Mm-hmm. So um, right when I, when the tech came out and said, we recommend having a biopsy, I actually did not get a copy of my report. I didn't have a radiologist sit with me. 
I was mm-hmm. only told to go get a biopsy. And I even mm-hmm. sat there and I said, uh, should I could be concerned? And mm-hmm. I, I recognize that like texts aren't necessarily supposed to tell you anything. Yeah. Um, but I like no one called me. My my own doctor didn't call me to say, hey, you might have cancer. So I had zero understanding of my sense of urgency around this. So I went ahead and scheduled the biopsy, but you know, the schedule doesn't know have a sense of urgency either because their job mm-hmm. is get that in the books and then it's very much it was like maybe like a month down the line. Wow. Because that's the nature of, you know, the business. And so I ended up a couple of days later, I kind of called and said, all right, can I please have my lab report? And they're like, what do you mean you didn't get it? I'm like, no one gave it to me. I didn't get a copy. Yeah. No one emailed it to me. Uh-huh. And so they sent me a copy, but still like I didn't, I couldn't read it. So I called yeah. my sister who is a doctor and I said, I don't know what this means. Please tell me if it's good or bad. So she reads it and that's when I heard, oh dear. <laughs> uh-huh. And and then I started Googling all the terms and that's when I realized I probably have cancer and it's not a Dr. Pimple Popper type cyst. <laughs> wow. That's so scary. And it's such a it's such an unfortunate unfortunate and common situation to find yourself in. I actually just wanted to talk about a little bit. So legally, you're supposed to get your like your doctor's supposed to get your report in three business days and from your mammogram. This is actually for your mammogram. Got it. And yeah. you're supposed to get a layman's term of your report in 30 days. It does not sound like that happened. Um, I, only after I pushed for it. Yeah. Okay. So let's just talk about a little bit of, because you got called back from your mammogram. So I don't want anyone listening to like automatically being called back from your mammogram does not mean you have breast cancer. In her case, it was, but it's not always the case. So if you go in for your mammogram, then they, they about 10% of women are called back from their mammogram. And the numbers are higher if it's your first mammogram because we don't have anything to compare it to. So of those, ten, let's say 100 women come in for their mammogram, 10 of those people will get called back, okay? Of those 10 women that get called back, six of them will be told everything's normal. Okay. Another two of them will be told everything is probably normal. And we're saying it's probably benign. That means you have a less than 2% chance of it being cancer. We essentially follow you very closely every six months for two years, and then we bless it. Um, So the other two women, two of them will end up needing a biopsy. Okay. And of the biopsies that we do, 80% of them are benign for when we give it a category four or a BIRADS four. When you use the term BIRAD, it stands for Breast Imaging Reporting and Data System. So the radiologist gives you either a four, which means it's suspicious, and that ranges from two to 95% chance of that being cancer. So on average, 80% of people will be told, will end up having benign results from that. But if you get a category five, which a lot of times people do, it sounds like you might've had that, where it says highly suspicious for cancer. And what that means is it's a greater than, we're, the radiologist is essentially telling you that it's a greater than 95% of this, it's greater than a 95% chance of this being cancer. So even if we get a benign result, we're not gonna buy it based on its imaging appearance. It's very suspicious. Now, usually those conversations are between, like if I'm recommending a biopsy, I'm sitting down with you and I'm telling you, I think we need a biopsy. Like I'm worried about it. And if I'm really suspicious about it, you know, I am, I'll, I'll kind of plant the seed. Like I am a little, I am pretty worried about this. And then we have the conversation, what don't you like about it? I don't like the borders. I don't like how big it is and that you, you know, this is a new finding or that this is palpable and kind of explain what I'm seeing. And if someone straight up asks me, do you think it's cancer? I'll say, do you want to know the truth? Yes, I do in my heart believe it is, but not when we do the biopsy, it's not only telling us, is it breast cancer, but it's also giving us receptor information. So a lot of information comes from that. And I just want to use this opportunity to talk a little bit about the receptors because a lot of times people see that in their imaging report and they don't know what it means. But basically we're testing for something called estrogen and progesterone receptors. So that's where the ER and PR comes in. And then HER2 new, which is a, um, a cancer, it's a tumor suppressor gene. So, uh, and basically the, the presence or absence of that will tell us how aggressive these tumors are. So you had ERPR negative, HER2 positive, right? Correct. Yeah. 
So that's actually the most classic type. That's the most common type of breast cancer that we have. Um, and there are certain types and, and your treatment will vary, very base. Your treatment will vary very much based on those receptors. So in addition to the type of cancer and the size, the receptors really do play an important role as well. And every cancer therapy is very individualized based on that and your age and everything like that. Um, so, yeah. Did you have these conversations say... with a radiologist or no? <laughs> um, uh, not the first one. And I just was sitting here going, gosh, Robin, I wish you were my doctor. I wish yeah, you were my I know. <laughs> Let's come Zero conversations. Um, I had, it was just the tech coming out and saying, please get a biopsy. And so um, I did, when I did get, did get the biopsy, I looked at the doctor doing the biopsy. I said, who's going to call me? And she goes, me, I'm going to call mm -hmm. you. And the way she said it, I, I, I probably yeah. like nearly cried. No, mm -hmm. just that I just, just that, you know, she was so like set on telling me and telling me face to face. And I, mm -hmm. that's what I need right now. I, um, I'm sorry you went through that. And unfortunately, I think a lot of people have that experience, um, you know, of lack of communication between the radiologist and the patient. Um, like there was someone reading that there is a radiologist behind the scenes reading that and saying she needs a biopsy, but it could have been them to come in and tell you, you know, and have that yeah. conversation. So you could ask the questions at that time. I mean, I think at this point, you could always say if someone offers you, like if a tech says you need a biopsy, you can say, can I speak to a radiologist? I would like to speak to a radiologist. And if they, like, they're there, they're somewhere, you know, if they're not on site, then they're, you know, can they give me a call? Can they, you know, even if it's not right now, but I do think it is a, an, a great time to advocate for yourself and, and ask the questions of, can I speak? I need more information. Yeah, right. and like, I, what that's is something I wish I knew to ask. Yeah. I just sat there and I said, okay, I'll go get my biopsy now. Right. And did you get a category five, like a highly suspicious? I did. I, I had by yeah. five, yes. So reading that in your report, like not knowing how suspicious we are and then reading that is very, I mean, your, your stomach must have dropped. Yes, because I Googled that, you know, as they, they tell you what the categories are on, you know, somewhere on a website. Mm -hmm. And that when I saw the highly suspicious of cancer, that's when the world just mm -hmm. turns upside down. Yeah. And this is a conversation where I say, you know, I am really worried about it. I do feel like we probably should start getting a team lined up of a, of a surgeon. Like usually that's the first stop is a breast surgeon who ultimately this thing will come out, whether it's, you know, if surgery first, or you do, sometimes they do a chemo first approach where they try to shrink it before you go to surgery to improve your outcomes. But ultimately you need to start having that team in place. So often I will say, would you like me to, you know, I try to do the biopsy within the next like two to three business days. I know that's not always feasible, um, like where, you, depending on where you're located. But I, if I give someone a category five, I'm usually like, let's try to get you in by the end of the week. And let's try to get you set up with the surgeon the following week so we can move the thing along. And that is not what happened. No. And again, I keep thinking, wow, well, I wish I was Robin. I know. <laughs> Robin for president. Yes. I, <laughs> president of the babes. Robin for chief breast radiologist, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you had to wait a while. Um, I ended up um, getting advice to book the biopsy, but then call every day to see if there's an opening to get me in earlier. So I did end up getting it within a week and then, mm -hmm. um, and then things followed soon after, but, but I really, wouldn't really have, have to advocate. That, yeah, correct. Yeah. And I'm I was sorry. on the sidelines, like, Alice, you need to tell them that this is not normal. Alice, make them an appointment, but also <laughs> Wanting to balance, not adding more stress to her plate, right? But it was very atypical from my experience. Like, mm -hmm. as soon as I saw the nurse practitioner, she was sending me to the surgeon same day or next day. And so I'm like, I don't think it should be waiting. Are you sure? And but right. obviously, it's a delicate situation, and you don't want to add more turmoil or stress to well, an I think already it's a really stressful situation. I think it's a really important important point that, to point out that you have to advocate for yourself, right? Like yeah. that maybe, you know, a month is too long for you to wait if you have a category five, 
you know, highly suspicious for malignancy mass in your breast. Like this is just going to delay treatment. And the sooner we can get information, the sooner you can start your treatment and get your team in place and start, you know, tackling this. And I think that's a really important um, thing. I mean, your cancer besties tool will help you kind of navigate those situations. Like if you plug it into category five, like I'm sure that it will kind of spit out that how soon can I get the biopsy? You know, right. what are the next steps? You know, do you think this is cancer? I think that's a very fair question for a patient to ask the radiologist if they are able to speak to a radiologist. Yeah, I, yeah. I don't even think I would have thought to say, can I speak to a radiologist? So with my last surgery, I had a reconstruction uh, maybe like three months ago and right mm -hmm. after. So I had to go in because I actually had a breast cord or some cording in my left side. And when I came out of surgery, I, I felt some cording on the other side. And I was like, how is this possible? I just got out of surgery. Like, how did he miss all of these things? And so I was mm -hmm. actually in with an ultrasound tag and she was doing um, my ultrasound, obviously looking for kind of the lumps and bumps we were feeling. I also had some fat grafting, which can make it feel like there's also lumps and bumps in there that feel suspicious. Um, and I was kind of pushing back with the radiologist, like, or I'm sorry, with the ultrasound tech of like, mm -hmm. are you sure? Like, I'm feeling these things, you're feeling these things. And actually the radiologist came in and, and spoke to me without me even mm -hmm. asking. So that's good. very thankful for that as well, because I wouldn't have thought to ask. And it really just highlights the different experiences that two people might have in the same type of exactly. setting, right? With a radiologist. And um, yeah, I mean, that is really what my platform, the Booby Docs is about because right? Like most people don't ever meet their, well, a lot of times most people don't meet a radiologist, at least yeah. until there's a problem. So, and like, I'm really the, I realize that I am able to connect women with under, like, like, like similar to you, helping them understand what these different things means, what to expect and how to advocate for yourself, because it is so important. And I do realize that like, you know, the, there's a wide variance of of um, of care that you might receive, you know, geographically and also socioeconomic. Unfortunately, we know there's breast cancer disparities everywhere. So yeah. I really think it's such an important, um, yeah, it's such an important platform for those reasons. And actually, I want to use this time to talk about Missy, how we, how you guys found the booby docs and how we connected. Yes. So we were doing all kinds of, of research and kind of what exists for women, what were we lacking for women, um, which is how we discovered booby docs yeah. through the, the magic of social media, if you will. Mm -hmm. So I think we saw your Taylor Swift lip syncing. <laughs> it's my favorite. To <laughs> the anti-hero. Yes. Oh, it's me. Hi, I'm the problem. It's me. Yeah. Yes. That one. Uh -huh. um, and so it, just your your infectious energy and positive vibes, right? We instantly knew that we had to connect with you and and being someone that is just as passionate about saving as many women as we possibly can as we are. So I remember like watching your videos and kind of binge watching. I'm like, I hope this woman doesn't see how many like hours I'm spending on her channels. <laughs> and then I knew I had to reach out to you and say like, hey, so here's this thing we're doing. Can we connect? She totally slid into my DMs and I love that. And like <laughs> since this time, like we've really become uh, like online besties and she's, Aww. Missy's really helped me a lot to, I mean, she's provided her expertise in like this tech world, which I literally have no idea what I'm doing. Like this is all just, you know, trial and error and finding out what works and what doesn't. So I'm so grateful for you. And it's so funny because I, when I could tell when someone's falling down the rabbit hole of my old content, <laughs> because I could see that they like liked a bunch of old things. And I was like, oh yeah, like, <laughs> you know? <laughs> You're like reeling me yeah, in. <laughs> totally. No, but I always think it's like only a matter of time before more people discover my platform. And when they do, there's like just a wealth of information there. And I think I'm working with Missy to really help make that information more organized and accessible because there is lots of valuable information there and it may not have been posted within the last few days. So it's like important, it's like hard to archive and highlight what's important on social media sometimes. No, you're absolutely right. And I think one of the things like with, with doing a lot of discovery with the hashtags and seeing what accounts exist and what information's out there, it's like 
there was such a surplus of information during October and Breast Cancer Awareness Month, right? But we all but know it's that gone. it exists. And it's gone though, right? Yeah. So like, how do we put less focus on the awareness and more time and attention around what the heck we're going to do about it? Um, and I think that's an important important lesson, important just message for all of us. Yeah. And I think that like the important thing is that like breast cancer awareness needs to happen year round. It's not just during October. Like it's, I actually dislike October because it's like, it gets flooded with too much. Like everyone's oh, jumping the on the breast cancer awareness <laughs> yeah. train. Yeah. And I'm like, where were you the other 11 months, you know, <laughs> when we need I also you. feel like people like turn their brains off too. Like you get your first few like messages from all over and then you're like kind of, you're like you, i think non-cancer patients feel done with breast cancer awareness month after that yeah. <laughs> totally so it needs to happen year round and that's really a huge part of my platform and you know so hopefully when people discover me then there's just a wealth of knowledge and especially the, the booby doc podcast um is such a great way for people to find topics really like they, they can resonate with right so this you know conversation will live in perpetuity. So I'm grateful for that. Thank you for yes. being on my podcast. No, we're so thankful yeah. to be here okay. and, and to continue this conversation outside of October. Yeah, and I just know we're gonna do so many incredible things together, which I'm very excited for. Definitely, I think with our powers combined, we're definitely going to make We're gonna take happen. over the world. That's right. We are. <laughs> one one yes. boob at a time. <laughs> Or no boobs at a time. Or no boobs at a time. That's yeah. right. Yeah. That's good. Um, do you guys have any questions for me, like as the patient on the patient side? Yeah, I think this is an important part of, of why we're connecting, right? And how we kind of found each other is we're the patient, you are the doctor, obviously. And so our tool is probably only discovered once you've already gone through a mammogram or maybe you found a lump or maybe it's time for that very first ever mammogram and you don't understand any of it so maybe let's rewind back to the beginning of any any journey right breast cancer not breast cancer um let's think of the mammogram and i know i love all of your videos that you do with mammograms and making them feel less scary and i think that's yeah. probably one of the reasons women don't go is because of that scary cloud that is kind of hanging over them of what to expect right. and is it going to hurt and then what happens next like right now i'm kind of safe because i don't know kind of what i don't know and it, it's right. easier to think like well, if I don't know, it, it doesn't exist. And mm -hmm. especially I'm the only one in my family right now who knows that I'm BRCA positive because my mom refuses to be tested and my grandmother passed away from it. And so I, I keep having this conversation with my mom of like, just because you don't know, doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And, you know, hundred percent, we could go around and around all day. But so, yeah. So, um, yeah. yeah. So let's Maybe talk about a little bit about yeah, the, the, the expectation of your very first mammogram. So what, what happens and like, what questions should we be asking? Well, I think a good question, a good place to start is like, when do you get your first mammogram? Um, and well, I, I want to start off by saying I'm a very strong proponent of the monthly self rest exam because right, we're seeing a rise in young breast cancer. And a lot of these people are, are younger than the, you know, age cut of 40 and for average risk women. So we recommend getting mammograms at age 40 for average risk women every year. Um, but that, that leaves the high risk women, like a lot of people that are actually high risk don't know that they're high risk. And we're still seeing cancer, breast cancer, and people that are average risk at an earlier age. So it's really important to do that monthly self breast exam. So I always tell people, choose the same time each month, ideally days five to seven of your menstrual period, but really any time I like, sometimes I like to say feel it on the first just because it's easy to remember. And I always do a really fun, you know, reminder about that. But looking at your breast, like visually inspecting your breast for any changes, feeling with, you know, for lumps or discharge or any skin thickening or dimpling that doesn't feel right, you're going to want to squeeze your nipples to look for any discharge. There's no wrong way to do it, okay? As long as you're doing it and you're consistent about doing it around the same time each month because right? Our breasts fluctuate and how they feel throughout the, you know, throughout the month. Um, our breasts are very hormonally active. So if you find something, try not to panic, pay attention to it over the next few days, make sure it's not getting bigger and harder. Those are definitely the worrisome signs. But in the meantime, you're going to want to start calling your doctor and making an appointments so you can get a good physical exam. 
and they could order imaging if appropriate. Okay, so imaging in terms of, let's say you find a lump, then you're under age 30, we start with an ultrasound. And over age 30, we start with 30 and older, we start with a mammogram and, and then an ultrasound. And the reason to do the mammogram is, um, is really to, and we do bilateral because you really, it's a, it's a point in time to look at this patient that's coming with a breast complaint. Often they'll find something in the right breast and we find something in their left breast that is worrisome. So it's just a point in time to catch those 30 year olds that might be diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, and even the 20 year olds, you know, so if we see something suspicious in a 20 year old, then we'll get the mammogram and do the biopsies. Okay, so, you know, 40 every year in average is women, but certainly do a monthly self breast exam. And if you feel something, then you need to bring it to the attention of your doctor and get it imaged appropriately. I think it's reasonable to, you know, a lot of times I hear women say that they have, they see their doctor and they tell them, don't worry about it, it's just a clogged duct. Well, how do you know it's just a clogged duct? Are there any tests that we can order to make sure that it's not something more serious? Like what is the worst case scenario in this, you know, what, what's the worst thing it could be and how do we exclude that? And I think that is an important conversation that we need to get comfortable having. I know that you talk about this, but like questioning your breath, your, your providers, how do they know this? A lot of times doctors, we falsely assume that they are trained in breast cancer and and they're not like even OBs really do not get breast health education. So a lot of times I think that we're falsely reassured that it's nothing to worry about when in fact there is a problem and that's when bad things happen, right? That's when people are delayed or, yeah. um, so I think that's an important conversation. Okay, Agreed. so going, going, any questions off of base of what I said there? No. I, I think what you just said could lead into more conversations of like your yeah. doctors only know kind of like in their scope of practice, right? Which yes. leads so many women kind of in the balance of like what what next? Um, and like and, blindly and blindly trusting their doctor. Like, right, we know we have to advocate for ourselves. It doesn't feel right to you. Speak up. Don't, you yeah. know, I think we need to get comfortable having those conversations. Like I said, how do you know? Okay, so what yeah. to expect for your first mammogram? You know, so if you have a lump or some issue, then it's going to be a diagnostic mammogram and diagnostic imaging test. And in that case, you typically, we do the mammogram, we do the ultrasound, and then that day you, you get the results. You meet with a radiologist in many cases, or the technologist might say everything's fine. The radiologist reviewed it. They said everything's fine. Come back in a year. Or like, but I like to have that conversation. Everything looks good. Come back when you're 40. Or we need more pictures or we need to do a biopsy, um, you know, those type of conversations. So, you know, you'll get the, but if it's just a screening mammogram, if it's just age appropriate screening, then you're going to come in, you know, 40 every year, you're going to get your mammogram. And we typically, you don't get the results that day. Typically you go home and you'll get the results, you know, like I said to the doctor within three days and in the mail within 30 days, but, like we know in Alice's case, that doesn't always happen. So, you know, make sure you track down those results. Like a lot of times they can get lost and maybe they got shipped to your old house and you don't live there anymore. So make sure you follow up on those results. And if any, if any, you know, if you get called back, then, you know, pursue that imaging as soon as you can. Um, like I said, about 10% of people get called back and that number is a little higher if it's your first mammogram because we don't have anything compared to. Um, and yeah, so then, um, you know, hopefully they say everything is normal. So let me just use this opportunity to just break down BIRADS a little bit. Um, and actually just your mammogram report. So what your mammogram report will tell you is there's a few important things to get from your mammogram report, which is number one, it's gonna have a section called breast composition. And in that section is really important information because the, the radiologist is essentially gonna assign your breast density category based on how dense your breasts appear. So um, categories A and B are scattered, uh, fatty and scattered. That means that you're not dense. But if you read heterogeneously or extremely dense, that means that you have dense breast tissue. And we know that dense breast tissue makes it harder to detect uh, cancer using mammography alone. And it's also an independent risk factor for breast cancer. We now know we now know that having dense breast tissue is a risk factor for breast cancer will increase your risk as well. So it's kind of like a double-edged sword. 
So that's important information that you can get from your mammogram report. Um, if you have dense breast tissue, I always tell people if you want to know breast cancer at your, if you want to find breast cancer at the earliest stage, then you really should consider adding a screening ultrasound or MRI depending on your risk factors. So we typically reserve MRI for people that have over greater than 20% lifetime risk of breast cancer and breast ultrasound for under 20%. Um, any is great. Okay, I tip, I tip, I'm at intermediate risk. I get my ultrasound along with my mammogram. Okay, so that is in your breast imaging report. It will tell you if there's anything suspicious. And then at the end, it's going to give you something called a BIRADS category. And like I said, that stands for breast imaging reporting and data system. The radiologist is going to assign you one of many categories. So BIRADS zero means it's incomplete. We need more information. And it can mean anything that it might mean that you have cancer. We don't know it yet. It might mean that it's just, you know, a little bit of overlapping tissue. We need to work it up. So it's too early to completely freak out, I typically would say. But I would read what the report actually says. Like if you read that there's a speculated mass that is, you know, like if you see words like that, and I think this is really where the cancer breasties will come into play, by plugging that into your report, you can kind of get a sense of how worried they are. Is this just a typical callback or is it, you know, um, um, or should I be worried? I saw this number recently that about 4% of people that get called back from their mammogram will ultimately have breast cancer. So that means 96% of, of people that get called back will not have breast cancer, but we need to find those 4%. Okay. Yep. So then BIREDS 1 and 2 are essentially negative or benign. Those are essentially, the radiologist is saying it's a normal test. The risk of that being cancer is essentially zero, even though we know mammograms aren't perfect, um, but they're saying it looks good to come back in a year. A BIREDS 3 is, says the radiologist is telling you it's probably benign. And that means that they're giving you a less than 2% chance of that being cancer. Okay, you always have the option to say, I usually give patients the option, we typically follow these every six months for two years, but we could always biopsy it. Like if you're not comfortable with that, we always have the option to yeah. biopsy it. That is on the table because like, I'm willing to accept a, you know less than 2% chance of this being breast cancer. Maybe that's too much for you. Maybe you're gonna be anxious for the next two years. So I think that is an important conversation as well. Um, BIREDS 4 we talked about is suspicious, but it's, it ranges from 2 to 95% chance of that being cancer. So it's a very wide range. Yeah. Um, very. And yeah, so sometimes they'll kind of categorize it into A, B, and C to further give their level of suspicion. But if I'm going to give a 4, like if I'm very worried, I'm going to give a 5, which means highly suspicious. Um, so that means that we're saying it's a 90, oh, greater than 95% of that being cancer. It's very likely for that to, it's gonna ultimately need to come out because it just doesn't look pretty on imaging. There are some confounders that look like cancer that are not actually cancer, but we don't know that until we kind of take out the lesion, you know, and do that appropriately. And then but six means that you have biopsy proven cancer. So let's say that you, we know you have cancer and now we're, we're giving you neoadjuvant treatments before to shrink it and then we're gonna give you a BIRAD six. So that is the BIRADS breakdown. And I hope I answered those questions related to that. Yes, you yeah. did. Thank you for that. That was um, yeah. so helpful. <laughs> hey. <Good one>. oh. <laughs> Hi, no. I, oof. Oops. Uh, we were talking about, you know, what to expect for your mammogram. You had asked that it hurt. I'd say that it's, I mean, we could talk about it. You both have had mammograms. I'd say it's you know, tolerable pressure. I think it's a little bit dramatized in, you know, in movies and media. I'd say it's like a four out of 10. And it, you know, when we, when we do a mammogram, each picture only lasts like 15 seconds, 10 seconds. So it's fairly quick. I, I don't know what your experience was. Um, I think that it just depends on obviously your breast size, right? Yeah. Is it your first one? What's your pain tolerance? Have you had children? I think that makes a difference. <laughs> yeah. Also um, breast density does play a role because I think that the more dense breast tissue and the smaller your breasts are, it is harder to get 
you know, in the machine, get a good picture. Yeah, you got to be able to squeeze it. That was my yeah, problem. So. I'm like, they're flabbier because I had kids, I but there's not a whole lot to begin with. I know, but not we have to squeeze. We image, we, you know, men can get mammograms too. So they don't really have to be that big in order to image it. Like everyone's like, my breasts are too small, but nope, you can do it. Like we can do pecs <laughs> essentially. Um, yeah. So yeah. I, you know, I always tell people if they're worried about the pain, they could, you know, take an end set about an hour before to help minimize that. Um, and certainly like a good technologist will really work with you to kind of make it as you know, smooth as possible, as painless as possible. Yeah. Um, you also don't want to, you don't want to wear a deodorant because that actually shows up like calcifications on the mammogram. So that's why we always joke about that. Yeah. That's good information. Also, I always thought it was because you would leave it on the machine. Yeah. <laughs> no. It's good to know it's not that. <laughs> no, it actually, it can look like little white dots. Like we can even see some creams. So no lotion or creams on your breast because we can see that too. Like sometimes we'll see old ladies with like some desitin under their breasts where they get rashes and we can see yes. that as well. So yeah, no creams That's or amazing. lotions or anything like that. Yeah. And you know, when you're going in for a screening test, like, um, you know, you, my friend had asked me, can you schedule that? Like, you know, can you pop it and pop out? Yeah. Like a screening test should really only take, you know, 15, 20 minutes. You typically don't get results. Like some places you can get results. You could wait for them. So it could take longer, but, but if it's a diagnostic exam, that's going to take about an hour. I would allot an hour because you're going to want to make sure that they have enough time to take all the pictures that they need. Um, and also do an ultrasound if needed, and then enough time to go over it with a radiologist if that is how that clinic runs. That is helpful information. These are the things we should bring, or we should be bringing awareness to versus 100%. the breast cancer, right? Like this yeah. is the, the real reason why you don't wear a right. Yeah, This is the real oh. reason why <laughs> you should be doing X, Y, and Z. <laughs> exactly. Hopefully the mammogram is not going to show that you have breast cancer. Like that's the worst case scenario. So exactly. most people, 96% yes. of people will not be found to have breast cancer on their mammogram. So just keep that number in mind. If you're nervous about getting it, just know that, you know, it's probably going to be normal. And if it's not, if it's abnormal, it doesn't mean you have cancer right away. Um, you know, so be reassured about that. And God forbid it is breast cancer. We want to find it at the earliest, most treatable stage. So we could hopefully avoid some of the more aggressive chemotherapies and things like that. So it's never too late to come also. Like, you know, if you haven't gotten one in 20 years and you're just worried about what it's going to show, like it's never too late. Just come in. We'll make sure everything's okay. And whatever it is, we'll help you get through that. I think that's a big take home oh, point for you. So Mm -hmm. I think I just have one last question and and it's only yeah. I, I hear like I was throwing this term around and I think you were also saying it, but like we keep talking about our family risk for breast cancer or just our own risk yeah. for breast cancer. So how would you say that that risk is actually measured? Because how how would we know if we should start getting them at 25 or free, right? Like, right. So this is a great question and I'm so glad you asked that. But um, a newer recommendation and a lot of doctors don't even know this. So this is an important recommendation for you to be aware of, is that all women should have a breast cancer risk assessment starting at age 25, but definitely before age, before age 30, so that we can identify high-risk individuals that would benefit from starting breast cancer screening earlier than age 40, okay? okay. And so there, if, let's say that your doctor has not done that with you, and you want to do it yourself, there's actually an online tool called the Tyrer Kuzik Calculator. You can Google it. So it's T-Y-R-E-R-C-U-Z-I-C-K Calculator. Thank you for that. And basically, <laughs> yep, you're going to plug that information in. It's going to ask you, how old are you? How many, you know, did anyone in your family have breast cancer? So asking about family history, the, you know, the biggest risk factors would be like a first degree relative that had breast cancer, especially if it's premenopausal. Um, and then also, you know, going into more of the family tree, is there many relatives that have had breast cancer, like second and third degree relatives that might tell us that something's going on, that you might be higher risk. Other things that it will ask you is like, when did you have your first period? Because we know that, you know, having your period late 
uh, sorry, having your period for longer increases your risk of breast cancer. So if you had it, you know, at 10 years old, that would place it at higher risk than someone who maybe got it at age 14. Um, it's going to ask you how many pregnancies you've ever had, if any. Um, have you ever had a mammogram and do you have dense breast tissue? Okay, because we know that dense breast tissue is a, um, is a risk factor. And you're going to answer these to the best of your abilities. If you don't know it, you're going to say, I don't know. Okay, there is like an opportunity for that. And basically, based on all the, oh, and also, if you ever had any biopsies yourself, if either if they've been normal or high risk biopsies. So there are some high risk lesions that we know increase your risk for developing breast cancer, such as atypia or LCIS or things that might increase your risk. So we'll answer that, it will ask you those information. And then ultimately, oh, it's also gonna ask a little bit about your uh, background. So Ashkenazi Jewish people, we know have an increased risk for carrying a genetic mutation. Um, black people have a higher risk as well, but they're less likely to be offered genetic testing. So it's important for everyone to do this, okay? And Hispanic people also, we know that there's lots of breast cancer disparities in Hispanic people as well. So, Everyone needs to do this, okay? So if you've never done it, it's not too late to do it. Just You could do this up by yourself. Okay, so over 20% lifetime risk of breast cancer is considered high risk. Okay, so even if you, like average risk for developing breast cancer, one in eight, it's about 12%, okay? So, you know, uh, but so 12% is average. I'm kind of in the intermediate. I'm about the 15% range. Nothing really changes. I just gotta be, you know, keep up with my screening. And also if I had dense breast tissue, I definitely want to consider adding a supplemental ultrasound. But if you're over 20% or nearing that, like I'd say over 15 or 17, you're going to want to start seeking out um, a genetic counselor um, and somebody, a, a specialist, that, like a high risk specialist that can give you the appropriate guidance about when to screen for breast cancer and if you need additional screening or genetic testing. So I think those are the important things, but basically I do think it's really important for everybody to know their own personal risk of breast cancer and, you know, and carry that number with you. Robin, I knew none of this. Like <laughs> I didn't, I would never have thought to even like ask for an assessment, didn't know like, that it would start that young. Um, so thank you for sharing. This is to me mind boggling and, or just completely new information. You know, and I, it, it's so, I'm so happy to hear that. And it's new for a lot of doctors also, you know, like a lot of doctors aren't even familiar with these recommendations. And that's why you really like, if you are, if you would, I always tell people, well, number one, follow the booby doc so you can learn all this stuff. But also number two, like you have to advocate for yourself and kind of learn this knowledge yourself because, and even educate your providers about this. Like, did you know that you should start doing a breast cancer risk assessment? And if they don't feel comfortable, then maybe seek out someone who does. So you could always see like a breast cancer surgeon, a breast surgeon's office often have like nurse practitioners that can help you with navigate these things, run a real risk score. Like, especially these more academic, if like you're in a big city and you go to like a bigger hospital, a lot of them will have high risk clinics where you can get a real risk assessment, a good physical exam, and they can kind of tell you if you need more than just a mammogram. And I think that's really important. Yeah, so my mission is to make this, this information readily available because a lot of people don't know this. A lot of doctors don't know this. So glad yeah. we're talking about so it. Doing a great job. Thank you. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about what to expect for a biopsy. I know both of you had had biopsies. I'm going to give you a quick rundown because um, I know we've talked for a while. We could, I could literally talk to both of you forever. <laughs> so it's hard. Same. Um, yes. So, you know, for biopsies. So typically the radiologist will do something called an image-guided biopsy. So it's either going to be done under ultrasound, mammogram, or even an MRI. So all of them are kind of the same in the sense that, you know, the doctor is going to find the area that, that's of concern, okay? So if it's best on mammogram, we'll do it under that way, ultrasound that way. MRI is a little tougher, which we'll talk about. 
but both of them, the doctor, the radiologist will give you numbing medicine in the skin and a little bit deeper. Okay, so they're giving you some lidocaine. And that really just burns for a few seconds. And then after you're numb, you should feel pressure, but no pain. Okay, so I always tell the patient, if you feel something sharp, let me know, speak up, because it should not hurt. I hear a lot of people saying that their biopsies okay. were pretty painful and it should not hurt. So you could always ask for more lidocaine um, and kind of work with your radiologist to make sure your pain is adequately, you know, uh, uh, adequately addressed. Okay, so then the once you're numb, the radiologist is gonna take samples. So we're gonna make a very small incision in your breast to place the needle to take some samples of the mass or the calcifications. Um, you know, typically I take about, you know, at least three samples, but as meant, you know, maybe 12, like if it's, if I want to make sure I'm adequately sampling it. Um, and basically after that, it's really important to place a clip in the area that we biopsied because if it needs to come out for any reason or um, it serves as a marker and it also lets people know that this area has been addressed. So if you, you know, in the future, if you go to another radiologist, it lets them know that we have biopsied this area, so don't worry about it, or, or you know, correlate with the pathology. And then we, at the end of that, we always get a mammogram to show where the clip is. You know, if it's a younger patient, we might avoid that mammogram. Um, but typically, we get results about. I don't know what it's like at most places, but at my practice, we get it at three business days. Um, and and typically, you it's know, the difference. Some, it does make a difference. And typically, like I typically call the patients that are diagnosed with cancer myself. Um, if it's something benign that I think that my, um, you know, nurse navigator or my secretary can discuss with them, then then I'll have them call. But um, yeah, that's basically the rundown. MRI biopsy is a little bit more challenging because it kind of requires you to be laying on the MRI table on your belly with your breast and compression for you know, up to 45 minutes, mainly because we're re-imaging your breast, we're doing the MRI again and finding that area to target for biopsy. So I would say the MRI biopsy is the most challenging for both patients and doctors. Um, but we do that when we can only see it on an MRI and not on a mammogram or ultrasound, otherwise we would have done it that way. Um, the, the ultrasound and mammogram biopsies typically take about 10 minutes max. 10 to 15 minutes uh, typically it could go longer but um that's the basic rundown thank you for that i think um i've had several biopsies and and i would agree with you that the numbing is probably the hardest part aside mm -hmm. from the anxiety right or the ski anxiety that we always say like as you're as you're watching your physician run the ultrasound lines over the yeah. area and you're seeing things kind of lumpy bumpy and not really understanding what it is that you're seeing. And of course you don't want to distract them because they have a needle in their hand and, and you know, you just want to keep, keep things going. Um, yeah, yeah like sure. it, to your point, it, it really, I don't want to say it doesn't hurt. It did not hurt for me. Um, the needle was the hardest part, but at that point, I think my anxiety was so through the roof that I was just ready to get it over with. And you're like, do whatever you have to do to make this happen yeah. um, and just be done with it. Yeah. I always say that like the worst part of the biopsy is literally waiting for the results. Like the biopsy itself should yeah. not be the most painful thing. Um, but at least we'll have an answer, you know, hopefully soon and follow up on those, you know, the results. If you don't hear from them, you know, three to five business days, I'd say. Yep, agree. And then to touch on the the MRI, I think it's it's one of my favorite stories. If it if I have to have a favorite story about all of my testing, because I remember I like still having my natural boobs and and going and laying in this machine, and it wasn't there was no pain involved, lots of noises, whatever. But the the most awkward and funniest part of it for me was you're you're laying on a bed with your breast in these holes, and they're just swinging obviously depending on how large of a chest size you have so they're just hanging in these holes and meanwhile there's the group of physicians and radiologists and whoever behind the glass who you can't see and you're just like well here i am in all of my glory um it's take me it's such, a vul <laughs> it's such a vulnerable position and it's so you know people it make is. jokes about like the the banging noise it's like so many noises and things to expect. And I, you know, I really do want to talk more about that because 
um, yeah, there's so much going on and you don't, yeah, you're in such a vulnerable position and it's really yeah. challenging, but yeah. So hopefully you never need an MRI biopsy, but if you do now, you know, it's with Beth. Yes. Um, and great detail. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, ladies, we have covered so much and I'm so happy we did this and this is such a good conversation. And I think this is going to help a yes. lot of people. Thank you so much for Thank having us. Thank you so much for having us. <laughs> yeah, allowing us I know to this explain is the beginning. what Cancer Besties is. Yeah. Oh, I'm so proud of you ladies for turning your, your diagnosis into purpose. And I know this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship between the three of us. So thank you so much. <laughs> Absolutely. And I'm, I'm wishing you. you all, the, I'm wishing you all the breath. <laughs> Love it. <laughs>